and then relay all this fantastic information. There are, I actually, I prepped everything I was going to say. This is full disclosure on how I organize. I prepped everything I was going to say, and then over the conversations I've had today, I kept adding things that women say so much that I was like, oh, yes, this is why. This is why I am giving all this information away and telling people about this because all of these things make me so frustrated because they make other people frustrated. So I'm going to try not to get mad <laughs> when I do this and just do a good Zoom call and not get mad. Life full right now. Okay. But I am excited about my whiteboard and we're going to, I'm going to be drawing things on it. So again, with everything with Zoom, um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to chat or message about that because I can kind of address that as I go along. Um, and just to start, my, my own background, my history is, uh, my name is Dr. Beth Westy. I am a chiropractor by trade, um, but I'm a women's health expert. I'm an author, a speaker, uh, and I have studied women's health for many years and worked with a lot of women in a lot of clinical settings through a lot of different modalities, helping them with overall health issues, cycle issues, fertility. Um, and when I say cycle issues, that's sort of a general term talking about PCOS, endometriosis, um, as well as overall health related weight loss, hormone related issues. So kind of a blanket term there. Um, and really this was a big passion of mine because I've had a passion for women's health for a long time. And that was always a big chunk of my patient base with women, moms, um, and, uh, you know, women are the, like the life center of a family in terms of the health, you know, decisions that get made. And when women don't get the right information, especially for them, then, then it's really tough to make sure that you yourself are healthy and that you can lead your family to the best health. Um, so, there's another thing that I'm that I want to mention quickly before I jump into a lot of <laughs> content is that that I was I was having a conversation literally yesterday with a gal. She was talking to me about her health problems. This was at this was not in like a setting at all, like a clinical setting or on a call. This was literally at my kids' after school party. Um, their yesterday was the last day of school for them, and they had some party up at you know some lady's house down the road. And great backyard, tons of kids running around. They had this cool pond and a zip line where kids would come down the zip line and push in the pond. It was great. And this, you know, gal starts talking to me and she was telling me about a bunch of her problems and she's so fatigued and she's had all these issues and she used to be anemic. And I was like, well, when was your last blood test? And she couldn't, well, maybe I should go. I don't know. And I was like, yeah, I was like, so she kept going back and forth, wavering in her decision even. But yet kept telling me all these symptoms and telling me all these issues she was having. And I was like, oh, okay. I said, so one of the biggest things that's a problem for women is that when you are in that mode of not feeling good and you know something's wrong and there's a lot of stress involved in your life and she's got three young kids and all these other things going on, is that your thought process is so skewed that you can't even make a good decision on your own health because it's happening to you. So that's a huge, huge factor for a lot of women. And that I find so often that they don't even understand and can't even register what's going on with themselves. So, and I asked her, I said, so if somebody came to you and told you, I am fatigued, I, I have no energy or strength, I can't focus. Sometimes I can't even think about what I'm going to make for dinner and all these other things. I said, if somebody came to you and said those things, wouldn't you tell them to go in to at least get their blood levels checked? And she was like, well, yeah. I was like, so you need to go. <laughs> you, need to, you need to make an appointment. I was like, I can't even tell you any helpful information until I know that you've had a, you know, a blood, basic blood panel run, iron levels checked, thyroid levels checked, all these things. Those are easy fixes, you know? It, as long as hopefully it's one, something like that that you can take care of, you know, fairly quickly and, and kind of get some of your health back. But Again, some of that just takes some time and it does take time to really understand that when you are in that mode, when you are having those issues, your thought process is not normal. When you are really stressed out, your thought process on what's going on and what decision you should make next is not normal. And that's a hard thing to kind of maybe swallow sometimes is to realize that you're not the best one to make the decisions on your own health. 
when you're not thinking clearly about your own health. So that's, that's my info on that. And that's so often that I talk to ladies that are like, I'm frustrated. I'm struggling. I don't understand. And, and it's because they keep spinning their wheels and overthinking everything and not moving in the right direction. So this is hopefully my goal here is that to give you some solid info, it's going to be really different from what you've heard before, um, which is going to be good. But again, that you get some solid info to move forward and to think about your health differently, learn about things differently for your body and everything else. So again, if there's any questions anybody has, just, you know, pop them in the chat there. Or, you know, again, feel free to message me on Facebook. Um, I do have a lot of people contacting me on Facebook. And um, great way to communicate on Facebook if people are wondering about you know, something I said, sometimes I'll say one thing and it sticks in your head and you're like, oh, is that really true? Or how do I know that that's true? Dang it. So, and again, don't do the thing where you're thinking too much about it and not make, moving forward and making a decision. Just go ahead and message me. So um, in starting to talk about women's health and nutrition, when I really was working with a lot of women and even for me in school and all the nutrition, you know, seminars, and lectures, and everything that I went through, all the books that I read on supplements and everything, I noticed a trend with, that, with everything. And it was not that there wasn't good information out there, but it was all just from one angle. And when I started really working with a lot of women and going back and referencing everything that I had learned, pulling out you know, books and charts and all these other things, I was like, yeah, but this is all just, again, still one recommendation you know, for these people and, and not necessarily geared towards women. So I actually had to dive into a lot of my acupuncture um, and my Chinese medicine background and uh, some Ayurvedic um, background. And that's where I pulled out a lot of information and started gearing things for women specifically. And then from that created an entire nutrition recommendation for women. Um, now, before I even get into what that is and how that relates to the body, a lot of times what I talk to women about when they're frustrated and everything else with their health, with their weight, is that we go through a, a nutritional like cellular cleansing where we flush ex ex excess hormones out of the body. And I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like. I did that on my last Zoom call, but we'll touch on that again today because you need to kind of reset the body get it moving again, and then really start working with the hormones. Hormones have a lot to do with it. Um, and I can't, I always do this. I'm such a dork. But in my head pops this thing, and if I don't say it, I'm going to keep thinking of it the rest of the night. My favorite joke on hormones, how do you make a hormone? Sticker in the crotch. Just awful. It's just an awful joke. Anyway, so that's my one joke on hormones. Um, but when you look back through the history of nutrition and everything's geared for men that's because um, around the early 1900s was when they first started compiling some information the first they mean like like the u.s government started compiling information making like pamphlets and things for people on nutrition this is sort of some of the first documented stuff on nutrition and you know i don't know if you guys remember things like the four main food groups or the five food groups or the food pyramid or the, the my plate and all these other things they have now that all started back in the early 1900s and they had like seven food groups and they, some of the stuff they had was totally ridiculous. Um, but again, their technology and the research wasn't what it is now, all these other things, but the basic models of how they went about getting information and a lot of the information that they gathered was um, still today. Nutrition recommendations are based off of that time frame and what they compiled at, the, at that time. And in terms of pharmaceuticals and the medical industry and everything, when you look at how research is still conducted today, it is very male-centric, meaning research is mostly done on men. Clinical trials are done on men. Um, and then oftentimes it's a male-dominated field. Um, I, as a chiropractor, I am in a male-dominated field. Um, and so I know just how tough it can be to be a female in a male-dominated field and how things are very skewed towards males. I mean, I walk into a chiropractic seminar and they think that, you know, and this has happened since the beginning, but they assume I'm the receptionist and they try and send me across the hall to where all the receptionists are. Um, and it's, um, so it's just, it's sort of the world that, that we live in, but to really understand that there is a very different 
you know, recommendation that has always been there. It's always been underlying in everything that you've read, everything that's being presented, every label that's on every piece of food and everything. Um, so one of the things that I talk about, especially when I talk about protein recommendations for women, um, and in the past week, I've had a lot of conversations on that. I actually sort of, somebody was really kind of upset that I was recommending this much protein and was messaging me on Facebook, fiercely messaging me. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that this is really different information, but this is really what I've gotten the best result with with women. And, and it, it is very different. She's like, well, I don't even understand. Da, 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 da. And I was like, well, and I told her, I was like, you got to look. If you look on the FDA website, they will tell you that women are recommended only like 46 grams of protein every day, which is not really that much. I mean, like a regular, like chicken breast, there's like 43 grams of protein in that. So I consider that a very baseline, like that's the bottom level you should get, very minimum every day. But is that good for metabolism growth, the stressful environment that we all live in? Does that help you not only, you know, sustain everything, but thrive on top of that, meaning excel with your health, have the, the weight that you want to have, that type of a thing. No, maintaining that protein level does not help with that. Um, and every body is different. I mean, for those of you that know me, I am a huge person. I am 6'2". For me to eat the same amount of protein as somebody else who's literally a foot shorter than me is ridiculous. You know, that, that would make me severely malnourished. Um, so it, it depends on, on your goals, your health goals, your physical size, your metabolism, all these things really you know, but that's not the recommendation that's out there, the recommendation. And it goes, it goes by age group. They do it by like age groups. And, um, I think it's from like the, the as soon as gals hit 14, you know, like 10 to 13 is less than that, like maybe 36 grams of protein or something like that. But once they hit 14 years old, it's 14 to 17 is like 46 grams of protein, or maybe it's 47, something like that. And then from 18 on, it's the same. And, and, and as the female age groups go up, it, that protein amount remains the same. So you can't tell me that even for you right now, that you know that you should be getting the same amount of protein that you were getting when you were 14. I mean, that's not even, you don't even have the same body. You don't have the same chemistry going on, any of that. The stresses you're going to have in your life are very different. The sleep you need is very different. So of course the nutrition recommendations are going to have to be different. And so that's where a lot of this, information is coming from that. I just don't follow the status quo on what's out there. Um, which if you think about it, you're like, yeah, that kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. Well, they have, it's more of a recent thing that they've changed sleep recommendations for kids and people and stuff. And they update that stuff all the time. I honestly believe they just have not gotten around to updating this stuff for women. So that is my big goal with my book that I really hope people take a close look at it. Um, and realize that there's a lot of pieces missing for women and that's why women struggle. Um, the things that I hear so often is that women are like, you know, I'm smart. I do research. I've read these books. I've done these other programs. I've done X, Y, and Z before, and maybe I got somewhat of a result, but oh, I'm really missing out on this, or I just can't, you know, I don't understand why it's so much harder for me now or what's different or, and, but it's every, oh, ladies always turn around on themselves. They're like, what am I doing wrong? It, it, I, I got to be doing something wrong. And it's, you're not doing anything wrong. You're following something that's not meant for the body that you have because your body changes. So that's the biggest key that you're missing. Uh, and also women are like, well, you know, I, I was really good and I was super strict. So they're being like on this really rigid diet, which long term is not a lifestyle plan to follow. And in eating a cookie every now and then, you should, you know, you should have desserts. You should, you know, and, and life happens, right? You have to have your metabolism working for you so that you can have a cookie or a treat or dessert or whatever, and it doesn't make everything crash. You know, when your metabolism is working in your favor, those little things don't matter because your body just is burning all the time. So that's, that's the goal to get to. And it's, and you can do it. You just got to work with your body and then be patient and wait for your body chemistry to change. Um, and then the other thing I hear from women so often, like every day is why am I struggling so much? Why is this so hard? Women are so, so frustrated, frustrated with the process, 
frustrated with themselves mm -hmm. and they just have a really, really hard time with it. So um, the last piece that I hear for women, especially when there's a cost issue involved, um, it, and, and it is, you know, when you make an investment in your health, it is, it is an investment. It's going to be your energy, your time, your money working towards something for you. But honestly, I don't believe there's a better investment than yourself, whether it be um, a, you know, a health program or going to a gym or getting a trainer or, or reading some type of book that's nourishing your mind or even taking an art class that's fulfilling some piece of your soul. I think you know, that's an essential part of fulfilling you. And then again, women don't do that enough because they're worried about being some type of you know, financial burden to their families. So just a little, another little piece I think that women need to kind of invest in themselves in whatever area they feel that they need to. Um, so, all right, so enough about all of that stuff. We're going to talk about women's information, hormones and everything. Now, when, um, when I cover hormone information, I always do a little bit of background info because if I just jump in, women are like, wait, what? Oh, poor estrogen, progesterone, those sound familiar, but I'm not sure about it. What? So this is where I'm going to start. Um, make sure you guys can see this. And then it's not reversed. You guys are going to tell me if this is if this is backwards, right? Just lie to me and say yes. <laughs> oh, I'm writing with my left hand. I didn't think this through. That's a 14. Does that look normal to everybody or is it backwards? Okay. And then this is a 28. Gosh, I'm really good at my left hand. I'm pressing myself right now. Super. Okay. Average cycle, uh, zero to 28 days, day zero. Now this is average. Everybody is different. Everybody is different. And a couple of key things here, especially when you talk about younger gals that are just starting their cycle, you know, around age 12-ish, but that can happen as early as age 9 or 10 or as late as age 16, 18, or even 20 years old. It takes, on average, two to six years for your cycle to regulate. So a lot of times, you know, I hear this from moms a lot of the time when I, I do a lot of lectures for athletes. And when I talk about this for women, they'll be like, oh, my daughter's, you know, 16 or 17 or periods aren't regular. And I'm like, they're not supposed to be regular yet. It can take two to four years for them to sort of regulate in your body to figure out what's going on. So anyway, so this is just an average. Your average may be different. It could be 23 days or 24 days or it could be 35 days. Whatever your normal is, is normal for you. Things that impact your cycle, um, stress is a huge one. It can make it shorter or longer. It can change when you ovulate. Um, it can also shut down some of your hormones or not have them impacted as, as the same way. So it makes things very, very different. So that's another just thing to kind of realize with the cycle. This is just, for simplicity's sake, we're, I'm breaking it into two chunks, before you ovulate and after you ovulate. So before you ovulate, you are going to have estrogen is the dominant hormone. Estrogen is, um, you have this hormone kind of all the time, but it is highest in that first two weeks. So this is the day you start your period, it's day one, and then up until about you ovulate, you, estrogen is higher. Estrogen does uh, some, a few things in the body that are super important. Um, estrogen gives you a lot more energy overall. It boosts your metabolism naturally. It's going to burn carbs naturally. And it increases your flexibility. So oftentimes female athletes will have their injuries occur most often when they're in this estrogen phase here, just to kind of keep that in mind. But also if you're working on flexibility as part of one of your fitness goals, this is one to really push it because you're going to be way more flexible during this time, which is kind of cool. Now in the second two weeks here, progesterone is a lot higher. So progesterone, oh, that doesn't show up quite as well on the videos I wanted to. Okay, you guys will let me know though if you can't see anything. But progesterone is higher here. Now, the important thing about progesterone to realize is that it does something completely opposite than estrogen. Progesterone actually slows down your metabolism. It slows down your digestive system. It decreases your gallbladder activity. What that means is that your food is naturally just gonna move a lot slower through your digestive system. Why does it do that? Progesterone literally means progestation. So every month your body is getting ready to sustain a viable pregnancy. Whether or not that happens, 
it's ready for it. And in pregnancy, everything in your digestive system slows down so that you can absorb every tiny little bit of nutrient from your food. Yay! So it's ready for it all the time. Thank you, progesterone. Now, other things that progesterone does besides slowing down your metabolism and slowing down your digestion and everything else is it will naturally burn fat. It's a natural fat burner. Yay! So that's kind of nice. But that means that during these two different phases, your body's doing two different things completely. Now, a way to track this, and some ladies don't know where they're at, or I, you know, my cycle's all over the place, or I haven't had a cycle, or all these other things. Once the cycle, once you start having a period in your lifetime, now these hormones are released primarily by your reproductive organs, but they are also produced by other tissues in the body, uh, neural tissue, fat cells. So they're at some level in your body at all the time. But it is, you know, it is most prominent during those childbearing years. Now, a great way to kind of track or see is to watch your um, basal body temperature. I'm doing a, another graph like that. This one, basal body temperature. Is right there now basal body temperature if you've never tracked it so if you're not trying to get pregnant usually women don't care but it is lower in the first two weeks and then higher in the second two weeks the total difference here in between these can be over a degree which means when you take your basal body temperatures you take your temperature first thing in the morning you wake up don't do anything you don't get out of bed you don't drink water or anything you just wake up take your temperature write it down and it'll overall be lower in the first two weeks and higher in the second two weeks. Now, with it changing to almost over a degree, that's a big difference in what you're burning. So, but that also goes along with the fact that progesterone burns fat. So having that higher heat helps burn fat more naturally in the body, which is kind of cool. Um, this is also going to play a part in... Um, when we talk about exercise, um, which I'm going to do on a different call, but just briefly, uh, estrogen gives you more energy overall. So it's easier, oftentimes women find it easier to work out kind of any time of the day. But during your progesterone phase, you may notice that during the end of the day, you tend to get more tired easily. And that's because progesterone can kind of wear you out and zaps on your energy. Yay! So anyway, so this is sort of basic. So how the body works. Now I do have charts on this. So again, if anybody wants charts, you can message on the chat or you can message me in Facebook, say, hey, I want some of these charts. I want some of these graphs. I want to reference this. Um, but because again, I, I do this stuff all the time. So it's, you know, I'm used to it, but most people aren't. When we talk about what foods to eat for estrogen and for progesterone to work with your body the best, we're going to be eating cooling foods for estrogen because the temperature is lower and we're going to be eating warming foods for progesterone because the temperature is higher. We want to help that. We want to have that difference happen so that we can burn more carb here naturally and burn more fat here naturally. Yay! This is when the body is functioning really, really well. This is when your cycle is good, your hormone levels are good, your stress level is good, all that stuff. This is when you, know, you do not have a buildup of hormone or crap in the body. So a lot of times with women, when we start, you know, when I start working with them, we do have to go through that hormone detox first before we can move on to have, be successful in just eating for your cycle. So eating for your cycle, what does that look like? What is that exactly? So cooling foods here, cooling foods here are going to be foods like, um, you know, chicken, uh, turkey. Those are, those are cooling meats. Raw fruits and vegetables are cooling, like literally drinking iced beverages, beverages that are room temperature or cooler. Um, do you have to do that like every single second of the day? No, but the more cooling foods that you do, the better. The more you're going to be working with overall keeping that body temperature lower, not having any spicy foods, you know, stuff like that. That's going to cool things down and it's going to help your body burn more carbohydrate naturally. So again, I have a whole chart kind of listing this out of you know, food suggestions, everything else. It's a really easy chart that I normally hand out when I, when I do lectures on this um, that people can keep with them. So if you would like that, I'd be more than happy to send it to you. Just let me know. Um, but yeah, raw fruits and vegetables. Also, because your digestive system is working better, it's easier to break down the fibers in those raw fruits and vegetables here. 
So cooling foods, you know, Eastern medicine, cooling foods here. Cucumbers are a naturally a cooling food. Mint, also very cooling. So these are some herbs and spices and stuff that you should be eating during this cooling food phase here. After you ovulate, you're in the warming phase. And you want to be heating the body up. So you want to be doing the opposite. So beef is very warming. Bacon brings a lot of heat to the body. Dairy products, very, very warming for the body. Um, spicy foods. You want your fruits and your vegetables cooked as much as possible because, again, your digestive system is slower. So it does help to break down that food easier and keep things moving through your intestines, which is helpful. All your beverages being room temperature or warmer, that helps keep that fire going in your body. And in Eastern medicine, you want to heat up the body more at this point. Again, that's going to help you burn more fat naturally. Um, there's also certain things like um, spices and herbs. Ginger is great for this phase here. Ginger, ginger is a very warming spice, and it helps with digestion, win-win. Uh, and, it, and it's just great for this progesterone phase. Now, besides the um, energy being different and you're burning fat, um, and, the, and the progesterone or the digestive system is slower, um, it, it really does make a difference when you're keeping your digestive system moving, especially when you're talking about PMS. I'm going to do a whole separate series um, up on um, cravings and PMS and all those things and why they happen for women. So, and dive into all of that because a lot of it's tied to progesterone and just not eating to fuel the progesterone enough. So otherwise you get these kind of nasty cravings from it. So, so that's to come, but this is sort of the cooling eating here warming eating here and doing this helps you work with your cycle work with these hormones and helps you burn more carbs burn more fat and you're shocking your body's metabolism by switching up how you eat again getting your body to work for you you now you're not depriving yourself of anything this is not a restrictive diet at all by any means and if you're to have like a hot cup of coffee in this cooling phase is that going to ruin it no it's just when you take a snapshot of the day and you're looking at the week overall, did you do things that were more cooling? Yeah, then, then good, then you're on the right track, you know? If you've spent, you know, if you had like tacos, you know, for dinner one day in the cooling session, ah, that's okay. You know, I do that all the time. I have three kids and everybody likes their taco made just a little differently, you know? So when we do meals here, I just make sure I don't use any spices on mine or I'll make chicken tacos instead and I'll, you know, um, make a salad with my taco meat and everything else, but I won't use extra spices or anything like that. Over here, I'll use pepper jack cheese and I'll put on tons of spice and use beef to make those tacos, you know, so we're, you know, they're eating the same, but for me, I just kind of alter those things a little bit and it makes a big difference for me. Um, so, little history on the big impact that I've had with eating for my cycle and everything else is this is, and this is something I actually talk to a lot of women about. Um, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of natural health care providers because that's, you know, what I went to school for and who I connect with at a lot of different places. And I actually, after my third kid, I actually suffered from um, ovarian cysts. And at some points they were so bad, I would literally be in one of my treatment rooms just on the floor, just because I would have a cyst and it would burst in the day and I'd be working, I'd be working on people and I would, I'd be on the floor. It was not a fun, not a fun time. And I went through and did everything, 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 honestly, everything. I went and saw other naturopaths, other, other women health, you know, specialists and and, every, and I put, was put on supplements. I didn't want to be on birth control. I had my kids. You know, my husband had a vasectomy. We were done. Uh, we're still, I mean, we're still done. We're still, we're still done. Um, that's beside the point. But I didn't want to be on a pill. I didn't want anything else like that. And I just, I didn't understand why I was getting these cysts. Though. I was like, there's got to be a reason. You know, I eat really healthy. I eat, you know, I'm totally gluten free. I, I tried going dairy free. I tried cutting out a lot of, you know, sugar. I did like a yeast cleanse and a ton of different stuff. And I went through and did all these things and progesterone creams and let cohosh and, you know, ton of these like female supplements and nothing worked. 
I mean, maybe some, you know, oh, maybe there's a little difference happening. But then a couple months later, boom, I'd be on the floor again from these cysts that were debilitating for me. And I remember after one really bad cyst burst, I, um, I mean, I didn't even know if it was a cyst. I thought maybe it was my appendix or something. I remember going in to see my OB. And um, this is a point where I really wanted to throat punch him because I asked him, I was like, what? What, what's going on that these are happening? Why, why am I getting these cysts? And his answer was, um, I was having unproductive ovulation. I was like, what, what is that? I've taken women's health and stuff like that and gone through the courses. I, I don't remember unproductive ovulation. What does that mean? And he said, well, you're, you're, you're not getting pregnant. Your body's not getting pregnant. So it's got these hormones you know, built up going on and you, you know, you've had these babies. So yeah, that's what's going on. And if you won't go on the pill, then I don't, then really that you're just going to have these cysts. Huh. Thank you, sir, for that answer. That's like the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. I was like, you literally just told me that I have a buildup of hormone in my body and all these things that I'm doing, my eat, clean eating and all, and, and, and exercising and being all these other healthy supplements and everything isn't, isn't doing it. What the hell, you know? Oh. So, you know, and I had done a lot of different cleanses. And again, I did some videos on um, differences in cleanses, an intestinal cleanse versus a cellular cleanse and, and what that really means. An intestinal cleanse is just rotor rooters your guts out. Um, and a cellular cleanse is this. So this is the cleanse I went through. And to be totally honest, when I, when I talk to women about this and they're working with their cycle, it does change your cycle. Like it will change. And sometimes people have spotting in between or spotting when they ovulate. And it takes a few months to have that happen. Also, another thing that they don't talk about for women, especially when you're going through weight loss and your body, your fat cells are releasing excess hormone in the body. And that's either these, the female hormones or even cortisol. I haven't talked a lot about cortisol, but that's the stress hormone and stress hormone impacts your endocrine system severely. So when that gets released from those fat cells, it has a big impact on your reproductive system. So if say you even don't even have, you know, any of this stuff or like, I know a lot of younger gals, um, like friends that I have that are in Cairo school and they have, you know, just a lot of stress, like college students, tons of stress and they don't necessarily have cycle issues or whatever, but the stress you know, they're like, I'm not losing weight. And I know it's because of stress. How do I get rid of it? And I have, and it's a cellular cleanse that will do that because it extracts that stress hormone from the fat cell and rids it from the body versus just kind of rotor rooting your guts out, if that makes sense. But so this is, so this is the process that I went through that made the big difference. Oh yeah. Timing with it though. It, it takes three months for hormones to shift and change in your body. For your endocrine system to have an impact, it takes a minimum of three months. Like whenever you go on birth control pills, they say, you know, use a backup method for three months. Or, you know, when you're going off of it, it takes at least three months, at least three months. That's how long the body physiology takes to change. And all this stuff that's marketed for women ugh, makes me so frustrated. They're like, 21 days, this and that. And like, okay, yeah, you can make a healthy change in 21 days but you're not going to impact the body and have a lasting result, impact the metabolism and have it last for you for women for in anything less than three months because hormones run on a three month schedule, especially when we're talking about a buildup of female hormones in the body. It takes three months for your ovary to get that egg kick in three months. That's a, that's a minimum. So when I work with women for fertility, I tell them a minimum of six months because it takes us at least three to We'll fix something and then another three to get it moving and to get start their ovaries the way that they should if that makes sense i don't i don't start their ovaries their ovaries start working on their own when they become healthier okay fat cells fat cell time okay so these are normal fat cells they're like little flat deflated balloons and everybody has fat cells you're born with the same amount of fat cells you have your whole life they don't disappear when people lose weight. These fat cells, they don't go anywhere. You're, you have the same number of them. When you gain weight and lose weight and you feel, you know, you get bigger and smaller, it's because these fat cells will change in size. And they change in size because they're storing all that energy in there. 
everything from your food that doesn't get used gets stored as energy in the fat cells and they blow up like this. Now they can blow and continue to grow bigger, bigger, bigger and get quite large, but you don't get more of them. The ones that you have just get bigger or smaller. So big key, especially when you talk about women and fat cells and cellulite and stuff like that. That doesn't, anyway, tangent. Okay. So when you have all this excess hormone in the body and you have, you know, what, and this is, we're talking estrogen, progesterone, or even cortisol. There's a lot of excess hormone here. You're, and it's, you know, from stress or from your cycle or birth control pills or anything like that. It's been floating around in your body and your body's way of protecting itself from having too much of it, from having an overload of it is to store all that hormone in the fat cells. So your fat cells will just grow and grow and grow and get bigger. And we're going to house more of these. We're going to make more friends with these. Yay! So you can, you know, start to lose weight and you can shrink them to a point, but your body won't let you shrink them beyond what they absolutely need like this because there's these hormones within it. So this is where usually women get really frustrated. I've been so strict. I've been so good. Da, 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 da. And now I just can't. I can't lose any more weight than this. I'm having all these other problems. And it's because they still have that overload of hormones. Going through a fasting day, a fasting cellular cleanse, removes that hormone from the body. And then your fat cells can shrink like this. How that works. What that is. It's a timeline. You make your body do it. This is, this is the thing, like doing, working with your body this way, you, it's almost like you're like tricking your body to work for you. It's not a trick though. You just work with what your body naturally does. So how that works and why that works is because when you do a fasting day, so you're not eating, the first eight hours of the day, your body is burning stored carb. And it's going to burn that stored carb for the first eight hours. And this is for everybody. This is just, this is how the body works. Once you hit that eight hour mark, boom, now you're going into deep fat burning mode. That is when those big cells with all that hormone in it get tapped for energy. And then that hormone can come out and the energy stuff comes out too. That energy gets burned. The hormone stuff comes out and there's a specific, um, there's an aloe component in a, in a cleanse that helps flush that hormone right out of the body. Otherwise, it'll want to hang out and you'll end up kind of rebounding back and forth. That's why people who do really strict plans for a specific amount of time and lose some weight and they rebound, it's because they have an underlying endocrine problem that doesn't get resolved. It just gets kind of suppressed for a while before the body's like, no way, forget it up. And the fat cells blow up again. I think they say that too. Anyway, so this is the process of going through a cellular cleanse. A deep cellular cleanse is making your body burn stored carb and then making it go through this deep fat burn where it's forcing these hormones out of the, out of the body. Now, for everybody, this process can look a little bit different, meaning some people have a really easy time starting and they can go through this really, really great. Some people have a really tough time. And sometimes it takes a couple of phases of doing this. So going through three months, like I said, with fertility a lot with women, I go through three months of resetting, you know, just getting things moving, and then another three months of getting it healthy because there's that much stored hormone in the body. If it's been going on for years or if you're under an extreme amount of stress, it will make things different. So, for example, a few weeks ago, yeah, I had a very stressful event. And I thought I was doing fine and I knew it was stressful. So I started doing some cleansing and I got to be honest, I did a cleanse date with two Wednesday. I did my a cleanse day on Sunday and it was literally the hardest cleanse day I've had in a long time. And I struggled and struggled and struggled because of the impact of stress on my body. It impacts you so much and it can, your body wants to store it. Your body wants to hold on to it because it, it's a protective mode thing. So I, I even broke out a little bit from my cleanse because 
I was kicking loose a bunch of stress crap. Super fun, right? Yay. Okay. So that is how the body goes through a cellular fat cleanse and how you can make your body work for you. Um, there's it doing that. It resets your metabolism. It resets your hormones. But again, a lot of people are used to hearing information on it works so fast. And in six weeks, you can have your bikini body. Great. <laughs> but for most women, it's not like that. You know, it's, it's just not. Um, also really funny side story. So my, I don't know if anybody on here knows my younger sister. Um, I have a younger sister. She's three years younger than me. Um, she, uh, she's a model. She's modeled for years, like a dozen years. She's been, you know, she used to live in New York. She's been in glamor and ton of Minneapolis St. Paul magazine. She's had a bunch of spreads in there, like, you know, like in the center where they'd have a lot of pictures. Anyway, she's been in a ton of stuff. Right. Um, which is hilarious because I'm like so the opposite. I get rashy when I have to go shopping for clothes. But, um, but so I remember one time she was, I was talking to her about some of her latest photo shoots and she was like, yeah, I was in shape magazine. And I was like, what you were in shape magazine. And she was like, yeah, because looking at her, she had a certain body fat percentage and she was overall kind of fit looking. She never worked out a day in her life and she smoked. And she would eat McDonald's, but she would go through periods of fasting or, or whatever. And a lot of this was either before she had kids or kind of after just her first kid before she was under a lot of stress herself. Um, <laughs> I just thought it was ridiculous. So keep that in mind that when you're looking at media stuff like that, like looking at people in magazines and stuff, that's not necessarily, unless they are a fitness person or they're a trainer or whatever. That's not necessarily the whole story. Do you know what I mean? I was like, I can't believe this. Like she was literally in her car, you know, smoking cigarettes before she was going into her shape magazine photo shoot. Yeah. Like that's not, that's what, but that's, that's how that a lot of the stuff is there out there that you're reading or that you're looking at. Um, especially for younger gals. I, I always talk about, you know, you'll read in like Cosmo magazine. They'll talk about, this, you know, actress or whatever and their diet and what they ate for lunch and all this stuff. And I'm like, that's not realistic. You know, like that's not made for real people. And you have no idea what else they have going on in their life or what else they're doing. You know, you're doing this tiny little snapshot of something and it doesn't apply, but people think that oh, I, I got to eat lunches like that, or I'm going to follow this plan just like them. And, and then I can have that result too. And depending on what you've gone through or how much stress you have in your life or your hormones, it's not the same and it's not going to work the same for you. So there's a, I think a big misconception for women and women get targeted a lot for some information. And it really frustrates me because so many women are, you know, I want to say fall victim to these ideas, to these standards that are not real standards and are not realistic for people. I mean, they're not real standards. Somebody who smokes almost a pack of cigarettes a day should not be in a shape magazine in my opinion <laughs> the only reason I know that because she's my sister and she thought it was hilarious Ugh. anyway so um so take uh, take a lot of that into consideration when you you know when we talk about health when we talk about eating for the cycle and and again if you guys want some of those charts or some of those resources I'm more than happy to send it if you want more information on the you know cellular cleanse or how that works or why that works for the body or results of it or how long those results really really take uh, you know i can send you that you know and when you talk about men going through weight loss programs you, you know you can take men through a program and they'll start dropping weight like that women they don't just necessarily drop weight right away you know they may they notice typically a change in their shape first sometimes it's like a clothes fitting differently the size is different but they have more energy or they're sleeping better or um, like they're just feeling better during the day. Those are big wins in, in the progress category. And it takes a while for the body and for the hormones to catch up before you're like, Oh, now I'm seeing this progress. Now I'm seeing the weight loss that I want to see. This is great. It's just a very different process for women and it's not addressed at all like it is for men. And it's not laid out for women like it is for men. Men can 
go on a diet plan and just boom, like that, all of a sudden they're like, yeah, look at the scale. This is great. And it's not like that for women. So, all right. Um, I'm hoping that this is good information. I'm going to kind of end here. I know I chatted about a lot of different stuff, kind of all over the place sometimes with info. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, you know, again, you can message me on the, on the chat here if you want, if you have questions on anything I've covered, except for when my book is coming out. I don't know that yet. <laughs> Question I get when I talk about all this stuff, I'm like, so, so where's your, when's your book out? Is it out yet? No, it's not out yet. It's coming, I swear. When it comes out, I'm just going to start throwing it at people because I'm so excited it's finally out. Anyway, any other questions though, I welcome those. Um, or if you want any of the charts or resources I have, I'd be more than happy to pass that along. Um, also, this is, I am recording this call, so if you want want the recording of it i can send that to you or if you know somebody who would want the recording i can send that as well i'm going to be posting it but um yeah so any does anybody have any questions i'll wait a couple of minutes and see if you guys have any questions oh as i talked about a lot of stuff hopefully you guys are all excited about um <laughs> Nutrition for your hormones and hormone cleansing and everything. Yes. Okay. So I can send, um, yeah, I can send you that, the cold and hot food stuff. Yeah. I can send that out. And um, it's in a simple chart, so it's, it's usually it's self-explanatory. If you have questions on more on the hot and cold foods, um, I can I can explain it. But normally, when I send people the chart, they're like, "Oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, cool, I got it, I got it." Normally, people have questions more on, "I don't know where I'm at, or I have a problem with my cycle. That's my problem." So usually, people know when they have the period and when to start eating warm and cold. But yeah. Other than that, thank you everyone for joining me. And um, yeah, again, I welcome questions, but thanks for joining and I will chat with you guys soon.